In March 1933, 17,264,296 Germans voted for the National Socialist Party. 20,680,000 others cast their vote for Democrats, Communists, Christian Socialists, People's Party, etc., etc. Lack of unity among these parties opposing the Nazis proved fatal. The National Socialist Party was in power. They made many claims and many promises. Das deutsche Volk ist glücklich in dem Bewusstsein, dass die ewige Flucht der Erscheinungen nunmehr endgültig abgelöst wurde von einem ruhenden Pol. The German people had embarked on that long, incredible journey that led seemingly out of chaos to unprecedented triumph. Promise after promise had been fulfilled. Austria and Czechoslovakia, 1938. Poland, 1939. Norway, Denmark, and France in quick succession. A place in the sun at last. True, they'd lost their trade unions and a lot of books had been burned, but it seemed a good sort of bargain, and one got to like being told what to do, having one's views prescribed especially if it meant a vista bright with the promise of grandeur and conquest. In the spring of 1945, the Allies, advancing into the heart of Germany, came to Bergen-Belsen. Neat and tidy orchards, well-stocked farms lined the wayside. And the British soldier did not fail to admire the place and its inhabitants, at least until he began to feel a smell. It came from a concentration camp a waste ringed with barbed wire and overlooked by watchtowers. Coming in from the flowering countryside in spite of the frightful smell, things didn't seem so bad at first. Children smiled through the barbed wire and women laughed and waved their hands. But Belsen camp was vast, and inside was a different story. They had not eaten for six days, and every soldier's stock of food was called into use. Water, too, had been cut off, and so the water cart was the most important thing to arrive.
most of the people seemed to be listless, beyond hope and astonishment. Hunger had probably affected them that way. We discovered that among this stench of disease and decay was something a bit worse than hunger. Moving vaguely on rickety skeleton legs, they were too ill to eat. How grateful they were for a kindly word or gesture. What misery to live amongst such unmentionable filth with scarcely the strength to pick the lice which inevitably swarmed over them. They seemed accustomed to the smell and the horror. They had seen all there was to see. This man had died by violence. Huts were almost impossible to go near. They were full of tangled masses of people who died slowly and painfully of starvation and disease, writhing in agony, helpless in puddles of excrement. It was difficult to imagine these orchards now, those rich fields where the stolid cattle cropped the juicy grass. For here, a few minutes away inside the barbed wire, was nothing but filth and death. Here is a pit where the inmates, in order to earn food, had to drag the bodies of their comrades but they were too weak to keep up with the rate at which they were dying, so the pit remains only half filled. The SS guards in charge of the camp were captured and lined up for examination. Their papers were gone through to confirm their status their authority, each with his death's head badge, each justified by German law. They were unashamed, well-fed, well-dressed and cheerful. There were women also on guard in Belsen, volunteers who came of their own free will to do their bit not sickly pale with hollow faces and hungry eyes, but well-fed and well-kept with a strutting arrogance. The commandant of the camp, Joseph Kramer, was removed for trial as a war criminal by an allied military court. The faces of the bystanders showed just a little of the hate that Germany has inspired. And some of the anguish too.
Meanwhile, back at the camp, those who were still living were being attended to. Supplies of hot soup were prepared, and those who could eat unaided were fed as quickly as possible. There had been no water supply for six days. The Germans pleaded it had been cut. We laid on water in a few hours and before 12 hours had passed, had sufficient to enable them to wash. Soap was provided, the first they'd seen for months, and an orgy of washing ensued. A mobile bath unit was set up and provided hot water for baths. Inmates thought there was a snag at first, expected to be beaten for going near it, probably. But when they learned that the dream was true, hot water. And these are the people the Nazis said delighted in being dirty. But the job of clearing up Belsen was a big one. After seven dreadful days, the funerals still go on. There seems to be no end. The SS men are not so spick and span now. Seven days of being shouted and cursed at and handling corpses by the hundred are beginning to tell. Ich heiße Dr. Fritz Klein, bin Arzt seit anderthalb Jahren in Konzentrationslagern, bin geboren am 24. November 88, also 58 Jahre alt, Deutscher aus Rumänien, 
und spreche heute am 24. April 1945. They were given an address by a British officer through a loudspeaker van. Sie, die Väter und Brüder der deutschen Jugend, sehen vor ihren Augen einige der Söhne und Töchter ihres Volks, die einen kleinen Teil der direkten Verantwortlichkeit für diese Verbrechen tragen. Ein kleiner Teil nur, und doch schwerer zu tragen, als es der Menschenseele möglich ist. Aber wer trägt die wirkliche Verantwortung? Sie, die sie ihrem Führer erlaubt haben, diesen himmelschreienden Wahnsinn auszuführen. Sie, die sie sich über seine entarteten Triumphe nicht genug freuen konnten. Sie, die sie von diesen Lagen gehört hatten, hätten zumindest eine schwache Vorstellung von dem, was in diesen Lagen vorging. Sie, die sie sich nicht spontan erhoben haben, um den deutschen Namen Rhein zu halten, ohne Rücksicht auf die persönlichen Konsequenzen. Sie stehen hier verurteilt durch das, was Sie hier sehen werden. Sie werden durch Arbeit und Schweiß wieder gut machen müssen, was Ihre Söhne und Töchter verübt haben, wozu Sie sie erzogen haben und was Sie versäumt haben zu verhindern. Was immer Sie one might ask why all the inmates surviving were not removed out of the camp altogether to a large town, for example, where there would be feeding and housing facilities. The answer is simply the dread word, typhus. A mobile bacteriological unit and all medical aid possible, together with 90 medical students from London hospitals, were rushed to the spot to deal with it. Lack of soap and water brought lice to the inmates, and lice carry typhus. To get rid of typhus, one must first get rid of lice. So contaminated patients were removed from their huts and put through a laundry process. DDT was dusted over them, and they were washed clean, wrapped in blankets, and removed in clean ambulances by teams working in relays in a miracle of relief work. Two miles away from the camp was found a large SS Panzer training school and hospital, well stocked with medical supplies. Strange that these should not have been used by the Germans for the inmates. Scores still died every day. They were too far gone, many of them, to digest any food, and there was a desperate shortage of nursing staff. 
Still, one could be thankful that they were not simply being left to rot away with neglect among a purulent mass of corpses. There were children too in Belson camp, though what crime they had committed was difficult to imagine. Most of them had been saved by the women inmates who gave up what little food they could get to the children. Meals for these children had always been few and far between, so they ate what food we gave them with infinite care. Nothing could be more dreadful now than to lose a piece of potato or a drop of soup. Clothes was another urgent problem, so an outfitting department was set up, and clothes gathered from shops in the surrounding towns was soon being tried on and gossiped over, as women loved to do. There was something symbolic about new clothes. New clothes meant renewed hope. They donned them with pride. Now he can look forward to growing up to useful manhood. There were more than 200 children under 12 years old found still alive in Belson camp. To these children, clean, dry clothes and kind words from a stranger were strange, undreamed of, mysterious things. Some had been born behind the barbed wire, in what circumstances one dare not try to imagine. Where are their parents? Here, perhaps? Or here? or down here, in this pit. Today is the 24th of April, 1945. My name is Colonel Ellingworth, and I live at Cheshire. I'm at present in Belton Camp, doing guard duty over the SS men. The things in this camp are beyond describing. When you actually see them for yourself, you know what you're fighting for here. Pictured in the paper, cannot describe it at all. The things they have committed, well, nobody would think they were human at all. We actually know now what has been going on in these camps. And I know, personally, what I am fighting for. I am the Reverend T.J. Stretch, attached as Padre to the formation controlling this camp. My home is at Fishguard. My parish was at Holy Trinity Church, Aberystwyth. I've been here eight days, and never in my life have I seen such damnable ghastliness. This morning, we buried over 5,000 bodies. We don't know who they are. Behind me, you can see a pit which will contain another 5,000. There are two others like it in preparation. All these deaths have been caused by systematic starvation and typhus and disease, which have been spread because of the treatment meted out to these poor people by their SS guards and their SS chief. 
We shall never know who they were or from what homes they were torn, whether they were Catholics, Lutherans, or Jews. We only know they were born, they suffered and died in agony in Belsen camp. And so they lie, Jews, Lutherans, and Catholics, indistinguishable, cheek to cheek, in a common grave. The living have been taken to a cleaner place. Typhus infected huts are set afire. wire goes down. The striped livery goes with it. Soon the fire will die, the smoke and ashes will drift away, and grass will cover the place. Do not imagine this was the only black spot that was uncovered in Germany. There were over 300 others. No German can say he did not know about them. The whole world had heard of Dachau, for it was publicized by the Nazis as a model camp, even since its inception way back in 1933. On the 28th of February of that year, the presidential emergency decree suspended the basic civil rights of the German people for an indeterminate period, and so eliminated legal safeguards against arbitrary imprisonment. Here were 32,000 men of every European nationality, including 5,660 Germans.
From the outside, one might at a casual glance have seen nothing remarkable or horrifying. But Dhaka was crammed with three or four times the number it was designed for. Here, as at Belsen, men knew hunger. Men became weak. Men fell sick until they died where they lay on the floor. In Hut 30 alone, there is recorded, for example, 72 deaths within 24 hours. Every day, the dead were taken from the huts. Here, as at Belsen, there were many who were too weak to be saved, too sick to eat. Typhus was taking its toll, and truckloads of wretchedness had to be somehow dealt with in the already overflowing hospitals. Dachau had its own brothel for the use of guards and favoured prisoners. As the women died, they were replaced by a fresh contingent from the women's camp at Ravensbruck. This was not used as a bathhouse but as a death chamber. Batches of prisoners were marched in here to die. When the chamber was full, the doors were shut and sealed. A man at the controls let in the poison gas, and another batch of helpless victims screamed their lives out beyond the grill. The gas chamber was conveniently placed next to the mortuary, 
and next to that was the crematorium. These great ovens were constructed exclusively for the burning of large numbers of corpses. In the last three months, official records In Buchenwald, there were about 80,000, of whom 34,000 were employed outside the camp in an armaments factory. During the first week of April, 25,000 were removed by the Germans to other camps because of the approach of the Allied forces. When the camp was liberated on April the 13th, 20,000 inmates remained. African Negroes, Albanians, Austrians, Belgians, Brazilians, Bulgarians, Canadians, Chinese, Croats, Czechs, Danes, Egyptians, Estonians, French, Germans, British, Greeks, Dutch, Italians, Yugoslavs, Latvians, Letts, Luxembourgers, Norwegians, Mexicans, Poles, Romanians, Spaniards, people were coldly and systematically tortured. There was no efficient distribution of food. One prisoner collected the rations for 10 or 15 men. Hunger and hopelessness turned some of them into beasts. Sometimes a prisoner carrying rations back to the hut was waylaid and robbed by other prisoners. Sometimes he ate the best part of the food himself. Sometimes he sold it. Corruption was fostered, for it gave another excuse for killing. All this seemed so remote from humanity, so far beyond the behavior of man. British members of Parliament came, and saw, and were sick at heart. It had to be seen to be believed. Prisoners at Dachau and Buchenwald dreaded being sent here. To them this place did not mean recuperation, only starvation, tuberculosis through slavery in an underground factory, and finally left to cough one's life out unaided and crowded in the filth and stench of a hut, unfit for dogs, but for some reason called a hospital. The daily collection of corpses was disposed of through this chimney.
First used in 1938, this camp was the center of a group of subsidiary camps. 40,000 people had died here since the beginning of the year. Here, the gas chamber held 200 at a time, and the crematorium dealt with 300 per day, every day. In the north of Germany, it was the same story. The few who remained alive were staggering on the verge of death. They were the survivors. And these were the rest, hurriedly murdered lest they be set free to live a normal life. The authorities in the camps took special measures to make sure that a man would neither live normally nor die normally. Neither should he sleep normally. He was surrounded by barbed wire and he had to sleep on barbed wire. Here was carnage and desolation. Prisoners had been dragged from the sacks of straw in the hovels called hospitals, shot and hastily disposed of by the first means to hand. There must have been some feeling of guilt, or presumably there would not have been an attempt to destroy the evidence. In the outskirts of Leipzig, an effort was made to prevent 300 forced workers in a factory from being set free by advancing Allied troops. 300 were locked in a mess hut and burned. This is where it stood. Some of the desperate, screaming prisoners broke out. Flamethrowers and machine guns were waiting to receive them. This was a woman. Some almost reached the barbed wire. Some got there and stayed there, for it was electrified. This was a Polish engineer. American troops advancing did not know that in this barn the Germans had locked 1,800 prisoners and set burning straw alight to suffocate them. In the morning before retreating, they had poured petrol on the bodies in an attempt to burn what remained. It 
it still smoldered when the American troops arrived. This man was shot because he gasped for air trying to escape while the rest of him burned in the barn. The most up-to-date institution was better equipped for killing. Transports of prisoners from all over occupied Europe were sent for extermination in one of the special Vernichtungslager. Here, four million people were murdered. As many men, women and children as you could pack into a great city. Old women were regarded as a danger to the state. Women torn from their homes, perhaps for the misdeeds of a distant relative, and packed cheek to cheek like cattle for the slaughter. These children are twins. When identical twins were born to non-German parents, they were confiscated and handed over to an experimental station. German doctors injected them with diseases and attempted cures. Success in the cure was not important, as these children were written off, unknown. They had no names, only numbers tattooed on their arms. This camp was scientifically planned with a view to mass murder. Vast extensions were still being built. Arrangements of gas chambers, mortuaries and incinerators. The normal extermination rate was 10,000 to 12,000 per day. An attempt had been made to destroy the installations but Russian troops were able to uncover most of it. Five crematoria with a capacity of 279,000 per month. Germans had watched them die. They'd wanted to watch them die, for they constructed special peepholes in the doorways of the gas chambers, where they could observe the effects of the poison gas Zyklon. Here are some of the containers, the mask worn by the operator, and the poisons used for injections. Not only at Auschwitz was extermination carried out on a large scale. Entire populations of villages were moved suddenly overnight, believing themselves to being evacuated and finding themselves behind barbed wire in the morning.
2,800,000 people were gassed to death here. Invariably, the gas chamber was labelled bath and disinfection. Here, one took one's last breath and disappeared in oily smoke up the crematorium chimney. The firm that built this was not ashamed to sign its work. Again the ovens, again the bones. These bones were sold to the Strem company for the manufacture of fertilizer. How many hundreds of thousands of people are contained in these heaps of human bones? You see where they went, to the cabbage fields. No doubt some Germans today can taste what they have eaten, fertilized by their comrades. This had been going on for a long time before we came. Here were found 820,000 pairs of boots and shoes. The dead have been buried. It remains for us to care for these, the living. It remains for us to hope that Germans may help to mend what they have broken and cleanse what they have befouled. Thousands of German people were made to see for themselves to bury the dead, to file past.